First of all, gentlemen, I say that was just a fantastic session. That was a brilliant session. Thank you for both of your talks. It was, uh, you. it was really good. Thank you. Um, uh, if I start a little bit on the personal side, I, I guess uh, both of you, uh, you know, came from, from uh, if you like, uh, from slightly unusual background. I mean, uh, Kevin, you say, you know, uh, as opposed to the sort of normal academic CV, you left school at age uh, 16 mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and then developed from there. Liam, you're a nephrologist, but, but you're, you know, you, you were there talking about philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe, Kevin, to start with, a slightly unusual background. Yeah, I, I left school at 16, did an apprenticeship with British Telecom, um, to, so I was learning about networks uh, as opposed to networks in the brain, networks in terms of communication. And that then gave me a practical aspect. I went to, to university later on, um, which means you can do an apprenticeship and go to university. And I, I had motivation then. I really wanted to bring about a lot of the practical things, such as linking more directly the human brain to technology that I've been able to do in my experimentation. All right. And that's what then took you back into the academic atmosphere, is that right? Um, well, in the academic atmosphere, I had the opportunity to do the experimentation, uh, both from, a, if you like, looking at what, how could we do things better? How can, as with the first telephone systems, uh, allowed us to communicate in a much more powerful way. Mm -hmm. So it's then taking that on further. Okay, if we now link brain to brain, mm -hmm. can we communicate even more okay. better? But the academic environment gave me the opportunity to do those sort of experiments. Okay, good, thank you. Liam, they, the, the, question you, the question you posed to me, you don't realize this. And in fact, it links me and Kevin together in a, in a unique fashion. Because if you were to look at the Kevin's home webpage, the statement which is on the home webpage... I've seen, I've seen it, yeah, absolutely. ...is the following, which is that we are all philosophers, and anyone who calls themselves a philosopher doesn't have doesn't a day, have a day, day job, job to go. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I saw that, yes. One of the things which the practice of medicine leads all of us to do, I think, is we find ourselves repeatedly in circumstances in which there is more than just the basically biological. There's the human, there's the political, there's the philosophical, etc. And many of um, the things that we encounter, uh, it, it has always been my view, as you know, because we've shared these kind of things before, <laughs> yeah. is that we're very well kitted up on biochemistry, anatomy, uh, you know, physiology, but we're not at all as well kitted up on what is the meaning of what we're doing? Where does this fit in into the greater yeah. interactions with society? And philosophy doesn't provide any solution to that, but it does provide a language which we can utilize to properly describe what we're talking about. It's, it's like the session here today. I hope a lot of people will go away and I think many of them probably use the term robotics and cyborgs as a catch-all phrase for yeah. everything that is innovative. Yeah. Whereas in actual fact, there are subdomains within them. And, and language, um, however bad it is for uh, us humans, mm. language is the thing which allows us to, to assemble problems and deconstruct them. So Nothing we should wrong. all be philosophers. I have, to, I have to say, John, this is going to be trumpet-blowing time. Sorry about that. Yeah. But um, you can look at your, your PhD and who your supervisor was and who their supervisor was and so on. So yeah. you can follow your genealogy back. And I'm fortunate. I only get, I need to go back about eight or nine generations. And it's a guy called Immanuel Kant, all right. who, of course, uh, okay. was sort of a di direct okay. PhD going, going come descendant. Down, yeah. okay. And of course, looking at mind-body duality, which he picked up from Descartes. And so a lot of the philosophical issues, although it's not my main subject, no. as it were, yeah. you still get this from supervisors. Supervisor and, and I've seen you, you know, you've written a book on artificial intelligence. Yes. Uh, um, you know, you didn't touch on the philosophical stuff today because I guess we, we already had that from somebody else. I mean, what, what, what are your philosophical ideas on something that uh, something that Liam said, you know, in terms of, of the enhancement of the body yeah, enhancement? What, what Liam you mentioned Friedrich Nietzsche, yeah. which I, I did bring in, um, because when you're looking at human enhancement, you're straight into the question of the superhuman, the yeah. ubermensch, mm -hmm. as you, yeah. you showed. And that is a difficult question, partly because how Nietzsche was linked in with other political things that were going on at the, the time he was writing, or just after. But if you look at what he was writing now, it does raise questions. If we do go into enhanced humans who yeah. can think in and communicate directly brain to brain, who can think in more dimensions and so on, they will have intellectual abilities way beyond 
what a regular human has yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So it raises questions. Where will we go with this? Is it ethically appropriate for technology to develop us? Uh, how, or should we keep it in check? How do we keep it in check okay, if okay, we can? Okay. Okay. And there's a political dimension to that as well. Also in Alcestra, as well as the Ubermensch, um, there is what is called the last man who was famously discussed by Francis Fukuyama more recently. And the last man in Nietzsche's model, now again remember Nietzsche's thing is about will and how you view the world, is somebody who is actually quite content, who really has a rather bland existence, who accepts that the problems of the world are, uh, are there and are there forever and who, who, who wanders on without a view to enhancement. Now, I think where the difficulty arises is, and I think that the history of the uh, transhumanist movement well illustrates that, is I think that there is a libertarian right dimension to it, which is that every individual, if they can somehow or other manage it, personally needs to be enhanced, mm -hmm. which ten will tend to give um, preference to the more powerful and the more wealthy. And there's a, a more, I suppose, liberal left uh, dimension to it, that these technologies should be, should be provided for the community and society at large. But that's a very difficult thing to solve in any dimension, mm -hmm. let alone biotechnology. So, so let's leave the philosophical for a while and go back to another thing that you, you uh, didn't touch on in, in your extensive talk well, today. Was, was, no, 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 no. You, you know that's too not many what I'm saying. To it's, it's too many things to talk about. It was the Turing test, and, oh, and yes. uh, it, was, it yes. was referred to by, I think, by Liam yes. uh, referred to it. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, there, is, there is controversy, as there is any time anybody tries to move forward in these sort of things, saying, you haven't passed the Turing test. You say you have passed the Turing test. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the Turing test is, of course, named after a guy called Alan Turing, who was quite a forward-looking philosopher, technologist, if you like, mathematician, from the 1950s when he committed suicide. And if you look at what he actually said as far as the Turing test is concerned, which is a mere five-minute conversation with a, a human who you, you can't see them, and the machine, you, you can't see the machine, and you communicate with the pair of them for five minutes and you have to say which one's which. Yes. And the machine is try, it's not trying to fool you that it's a human, it's just in the communication. It's trying to fool you that it's more human than the, pers the human that it's competing against. Okay. So yeah. you say, right. this is the human when it's the machine, and right. this is the machine when it's okay. the human. Okay. So it's, it's quite a tough, tough test. challenge. Yeah. Well, last year, a machine, Eugene Gooseman, yeah. achieved the 30% mark, which is a tough challenge, yeah. that Alan Turing set. In fact, dependent on how you... Mar it, it, it could have actually achieved something like 45% if you count the way that people incorrectly identify. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a test. In artificial intelligence, it shows that machines have got to a certain point in communication where, when you look at the test, as Turing defined it, um, they do very well. A lot of the time, machines, of course, do quite poorly, uh, just as chess-playing computers 20 years mm -hmm. ago played quite poorly. And one day, a computer beat Garry Kasparov, and it changed the world. And now, who cares who the world chess champion is among humans? It, it changed parameters. Okay. And, and we've had the same with the Turing test. The machine has passed it. I'm sure next few years we'll get many more machines okay. get to that standard. OK, one, one last question, I guess, to, to Liam, uh, in terms of the, the philosophy, the philosophy side of it. Um, you, you're, you said that we should be more, uh, uh, more literate in the, in the, in the words of, of the philosophy, that we should try to, to, uh, to understand better. But in fact, sometimes, in fact, the, the science moves ahead of us, mm -hmm. and actually the, the reaction is yeah. very reactionary. Well, uh, and so if you do that, that, there's a worry there, isn't there? Well, there is a worry there. Now, there's one of the things which is often posed as what's called the yuck factor. Mm -hmm. um, now, the yuck factor, on many occasions, may not have any validity. But it is a response that people have that this does not quite sound right to us. And at these transplant congresses, that has been an issue yeah. with regards to modes of acquiring uh, transplant organs, etc. That you can have philosophical ideas all your life, and they seem to be fairly robust. But, and this is where I suppose you're talking about biopolitics. That the, the first thing is there's a yuck factor. Yeah. That if something really, and the only way to overcome a yuck factor is, in my view, is to have a sufficient amount of of of, uh, of information properly disseminated, 
and properly disseminated in a balanced sense. I mean, one of the battles that was in the United States of America in the recent past was between the so-called bioprogressives and the bioconservatives, mm. which had an overlap with other politics and overlap with um, views of the other gender politics, race politics, etc. So we can't escape from the fact that whatever we accept needs to be acceptable broadly to the community. Mm. There will be times, and you've experienced mm. this, where people say, no, 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 that's too far out. But the more information we have, the more likely we are to be able to make the best judgment we have, which is not necessarily the right judgment. Gentlemen, this has been fantastic. I honestly could go on for hours. I really could. You're, you've done a fantastic session. I'm biased, but, but I think that I would have traveled just for this session alone. It was wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. having us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, John.